Morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm Howard Coombs. I'm the director for the Center of International Defense Policy, and I'd like to welcome you to our, the, the newest iteration of our IDP series. Uh, we ask that you refrain from asking questions until the end of the presentation and use the microphone that I will provide, which is the one that's actually clipped my uh, co uh, collar, so, or lapel, I should say, so that the online viewers can hear your question. Today, we have Colonel Mike Bevan. Uh, he is presenting, and Mike is uh, an experienced helicopter pilot with multiple deployments in domestic and international contexts. His overseas missions include Bosnia, Haiti, Afghanistan, and most recently in 2017, Mali. He has been a flight instructor, a staff officer, a unit information commander, with his most recent assignment being Commander One Wing here in Kingston, Ontario. He is a graduate of both the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces College. Colonel Batten is currently the Canadian Armed Forces Visiting Defence Hall here at Queen's, and when posted this summer, he'll become Chief of Staff at the Canadian Defence Academy Headquarters, also here in Kingston, not too far away. Today, Colonel Babin will present the risk of using Canadian Armed Forces in domestic operations, the need to adapt emergency management to evolving requirements. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Babin. Thank you. All right, thanks for taking time out of your busy day to uh, come see what I've been working on for the last, uh, the last few months. Uh, today, my, my intention is to uh, introduce you to my research and uh, provide you, uh, you know, an overview of, of, of the main findings. Uh, but most importantly, what I'm hoping to get is some questions and comments uh, that will help me refine my work uh, and, 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 uh, and make it better. So uh, I'm planning on talking for about 35 minutes, leaving ample time for, uh, for questions and discussions at the end. And if anybody wants to stay behind, I will stay behind at the end. Uh, we, yeah, keep your questions till the end, make it easier. And uh, I've already been introduced, so we'll bypass that one and we'll go right into it. So the question I often get is why? Why emergency management? How'd you pick that topic? Uh, well, it turns out that over the last 27 years-ish as a Canadian and as a member of our, of our military, I have witnessed firsthand a, a uh, deterioration in Canada's ability to cope with uh, emergency situations such as natural disasters. Uh, that at, as, as, as a government and also Canadians' resiliency facing those, those situations has also decreased. That has led to a dramatic increase in the use of the military to support that type of operation. Uh, and, and that, as a, as a senior military officer, is a, is a worrisome trend to me. Uh, it, uh, I think it deserves much more focus and attention at all levels of government in order to find a, a, uh, an effective and sustainable solution to this, to this, uh, to this challenge, what is uh, effectively a, a wicked challenge to our, to our, uh, to our, for our country. Um, the military can do many, many things in support of provinces and Canadians in times of crises. Uh, but the one thing I focus on exclusively is humanitarian and disaster relief operations. Of the 150 things we can do, uh, I focus strictly on that. And the reason I do this is because that is the operation, the type of operation that uh, requires the, the largest number of troops every year and that which has the largest impact on our military every year. So I focus strictly on that. Um, the literature on, on the use of CAF in domestic operations in this country is relatively limited compared to other fields of, of, of work. Uh, and where I found, uh, where I found the, the existing literature lacking, in, for lack of better words, to, you know, to, uh, in, in my opinion, was that uh, a lot of it did not address the root causes of the increase. It addresses the problem. We need more capacity. Here's a, an answer. But why do we need more capacity? What happened that led to us having to be involved so often domestically? And I believe that unless you properly identify and understand those root causes, you cannot come up with, a, with an effective solution for it. And then the other aspect of, of the literature that, uh, that I found is that often it, it does not put enough 
uh, focus on the impact of those operations on the military itself and the associated risk to our national security, especially in times of climate change and a rapidly deteriorating global security situation. Um, so that's that's how I, I picked it. Uh, the methodology I've used is a comparative policy analysis with uh, key informant uh, interviews. Uh, and uh, and before I go on, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, Naval Cadet Liam Brown for his uh, invaluable help and support in this uh, in this project. Uh, so, without further ado, what's happening? Well, to understand what's happening currently, you need to better understand uh, our the, the 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 Canadian. Now, I'm I'm making this very long story into a very short brief, right? So, I'm um, going to go quickly through it. Uh, you need to understand Canada's emergency management system. Well, at first glance, on paper, our emergency management framework or system appears pretty sound. You look at it, it is not unlike that of most of our allies and, and, and partners. Uh, it respects most of the fundamental principles of effective emergency management. It is a decentralized system. It is a graduated response model. It, 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 it looks good on paper, but yet every year it fails to meet the needs of Canadians uh, given the scale and and uh, and number of crises we're, we're 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 faced with every year, so it makes you wonder. Okay, so why why is it? Well, it appears that the problem is not our ability to plan for disaster response. Is not our ability to manage it. We have the structure. We have all the the key professionals that know how to do this. The problem appears to be a sheer lack of capacity at all levels. We have enough professionals and planners. We don't have enough workers to do the work. So that kind of sets the frame to, to where I'm going with all this today. So to better understand this and better understand what is... There you go. Better understand what is, uh, is going on, we need to understand the data. So I focused most of my efforts over the last 34 years, basically 1990 uh, and uh, moving on forward. In the 19 years between 1990 and 2009, there were six domestic operations, humanitarian disaster relief. In the 10 years between 2009 and 2019, there were 30. And in the 2020 to 2023, in three years, we're at 22. You see the trend? What it's showing us is that over the last 34 years, CAF involvement in, in, uh, in uh, humanitarian disaster relief operations in this country has doubled every four, every five years for 34 years straight. The trend is exponential. We have, now I have omitted, I did not include COVID. So 2021 has been taken out, any COVID related operation because they skew the stats dramatically. So that's not even, Otherwise, it'd be, it would be way worse. Um, we have, so I think we need to, to understand this and then understand that uh, there are some, some, some other worrying, some uh, worrisome trends in those 34 years. One is that the majority of tasks required, not required, requested from the military in those operations are very basic labor tasks, filling sandbags, uh, mopping fires, clearing roads, reconnaissance, health checks on population, very basic tasks. So we are effectively using highly trained soldiers who are trained and equipped for combat to do what any physically able Canadian could do. Any very basic tasks. So that is also a very worrisome. So for the force of last resort, and all we're asked to do is very basic stuff. What's happening? Uh, Another factor too is that there is a general consensus among the senior leadership in the CAF that our forces used on domestic operations are not effectively or efficiently used. So for example, in 2023 alone, the army uh, assessed that 25% of, uh, of its personnel employed on domestic operations were underemployed, spent a lot of time sitting around, not doing anything. And 
Uh, similarly, the Air Force flew a thousand hours uh, in support of domestic operations last year on four aircraft types, and uh, and the large majority of those flights were underutilized, using a big airplane to fly a few little odds and ends. So it's uh, an interesting trend. If it is truly the force of last resort coming in when everything else has been exhausted, they shouldn't be sitting around. So. Where are we going? What is the trend moving forward? Well, I believe there's two different things here, two external factors among many others that will, that will be most influential in setting the trends uh, going forward. One of them is climate change. The other one is the global security situation. Climate change has already had an impact on Canada, on Canadians, but it is expected to have a significant impact on our economy, our environment, human security, moving forward into the next decades. Uh, one interesting thing about climate change is, is what I call concurrency of events. In the past, different regions of the country and different parts of the world could back each other up because natural disasters did not tend to happen all at the same time. Fires burned at different places around the world at different times of year. Uh, floods happened in different regions of the country at different times of year. Uh, that is uh, not the case so much anymore. It is likely to get even worse in that we are now witnessing a, a rapid and unpredictable change in weather patterns that are resulting in nations fighting natural disasters right around, uh, right throughout the year. A good example of this is that a number of our fires in Western Canada from 2023 never went out. I'm not joking, those, fi those fires burned right through the winters and they're already active again. So the worst year in, on record last year is likely to get worse again this year because those fires, some of those fires were not put out, uh, not enough snow uh, over the winter. So that results in countries having to build systems that, that allow them to be more um, uh, self-sufficient and because they can't rely on each other as much as they used to in the past. Uh, global security situation has been on a steady decline in recent years. Uh, the, the current international context we're witnessing is often referred to as great power competition. Uh, for those not familiar with it, we're, we're witnessing a, a, an intense rivalry across all domains, across all societal domains between the world's most powerful states, uh, the US, Russia, China, and all of their respective allies and coalitions. That has, so over the last 20 years, we spent most of our time fighting counterinsurgencies around the world. We are now structured, designed, equipped, and trained to do that. But what we're now facing is that Western countries have to adapt their defense, their everything, structure, equipment, training, to face a peer adversary in what is now referred to as, uh, as a large-scale combat operation. Those are fights, conflicts between really large militaries and industrial complex that can sustain that for a long time. We need to adapt to it. We need to change for it. And anything we do that takes us away from focusing and being prepared for this reduces our readiness and ability to, to do it. Um, we have we have seen, so we are now dealing with a, a, uh, a security climate around the world that is more complex and volatile than any we have seen in recent memory. Um, Another aspect that's interesting about security is that the homeland, our home country, is now at risk more than ever. In previous wars, North America was considered a haven uh, because it was practically untouchable by adversaries. And if it was touchable, not enough to make a real difference in a conflict, no longer. It is now easier and more affordable than ever for any of our adversaries, small or big, to strike anywhere in the world using a, a um, a large variety of threat systems, both kinetic and non-kinetic, uh, that now puts our homeland at risk. In the past, we didn't have what we call the military continental defense, didn't have to be a huge priority because nobody was coming over. Just too far, too isolated, no longer the case. We're, we're facing threat systems that put us at risk and our society at risk every day. Um, so, so we will need to spend more time thinking about defending our home nation. Um, so given the change in, in weather, uh, in climate, and the change in the global security situation, uh, uh, 
Canada will need to revamp its emergency management system in order to be able to face uh, potential crises coming in, in the future. Uh, it has a, a, so those domestic operations come at a cost to the military itself, beyond the financial cost, which by the way, the cost of those operations is expected to be borne by the military. It, there's no other money for this. Every time those unexpected operations pop up, we need to cough up money out of our own budget to do this, uh, and it is not insignificant. Uh, but beyond that, it has a uh, it has a, a a significant impact on on readiness, uh, personnel, training, equipment, uh, the members themselves and their families. Without going into too too much details today, because we're we're short of time, can give you a, a bit of an overview of what those are. Right, readiness is is basically the fact you can't do everything at once. So when those troops and those forces are employed on domestic operations, they're not doing all the other things that had been put on their calendar for that year. And that leaves the military to decide where they're going to cut labor hours in order to compensate for the, the time they spent on, on operation. Put it in perspective, last year, the Canadian Armed Forces spent 86,000 person days on domestic operation. 177 days of 2023, we had forces deployed somewhere in Canada, and 131 of those days consecutive. As the commander of one wing at a time, I had uh, helicopters deployed steady between January and September. On any day of that, that period, we had helicopters somewhere supporting Canadians facing some kind of disaster. Training is, uh, is, is greatly affected, mostly in the reserve that trains primarily in the summer when we're dealing with DOM ops typically. So, uh, so the training is, is impacted. Uh, as an example, last year on a large um, uh, reserve training exercise in Quebec, there were 1,260 uh, planned participants, 339 showed up. Everybody else was deployed on domestic operations and missed the entire training event. Uh, that has an impact. That was the only event that year that those reservists needed to bring them up to, to speed on their actual job of fighting as soldiers, and they missed it. So... So training is, is, is impacted. Equipment is, an, is also another one. Uh, we, we, uh, it puts wear and tear on our equipment that is uh, being used. And that's the same equipment that's used for operation, for training. Right? We don't have a fleet of, of, of equipment just for domestic operation or just for training. It's the same vehicles that get moved around. Last year, the Army alone spent or put 900,000 kilometers on their vehicles on domestic operations almost a million kilometers of wear and tear on, on a fleet that is often not designed to do this, not meant to drive thousands of kilometers across the Rockies. Uh, they're meant to fight short distance. So, so it puts a lot of wear and tear that, that they couldn't do over the summer when they typically catch up on, on, on maintenance and repair. It had to be pushed later in the, in the year. Financial impact, uh, as I said, so last year the Army spent $2.4 million on DOMOPS. The RCAF, the Air Force, spent $29 million so 32 point some million dollars spent on domestic operations. It is not insignificant in a time of budget constraints where our budget are being cut and we need to cough up that unpredictably. Um, members and families greatly affected. One thing that, uh, so military families pay a heavy price uh, for, for their support to, uh, or for their service. Uh, moving every few years, changing schools, doctors, relocating, building new lives, friends, and social network. Uh, last year alone, 796 families had their posting changed because of domestic operations. Almost 800 families, last minute, were, were told, you're not moving that day, you're now moving two months later or a month earlier. And that has a tremendous impact on families and does not help retention uh, at all. So big impact on families that, that live through it. Our healthcare system, just like the civilian healthcare system, is greatly overstressed. Uh, we are critically under-resourced, uh, and, uh, and all those uh, troops that deployed unexpectedly on domestic operations canceled medical appointments, dental appointments, specialist appointments, surgeries, procedures, name it. Uh, that had a ripple effect that we're still feeling now as they are trying to catch up on thousands of of missed appointments, basically. You got to remember that that increased use of the CAF comes at a time when the CAF is dealing with a significant personnel crisis. Uh, we have 
uh, where we have a, a retention and, and recruiting uh, crisis that the that is felt in the reg force in the regular force and the reserves. Uh, the regular force is uh, short, at least in November, was short eight thousand people, and the reserves seventy five hundred people. Uh, plus 17% of the force is not trained yet. That leaves on the best of days, if nobody's sick, nobody's injured, everybody's got no family problems, nothing, 75% of the military available for operations. So you start 25% in the hole. So it, it is, uh, so it is, it, it has that much more impact. Uh, we have a significant effort to try and recover from that personal crisis called reconstitution. Uh, but everything we do that impacts our training, readiness, our members, or retention, only make things worse. So it, at the, in the best of case, we're expecting it's going to take about 10 years to recover. So we got to be very careful how we, uh, how we handle this. All of this uh, basically adds up to a national security risk, a strategic risk to Canada whenever you impact your readiness, your military readiness you're assuming a risk. You're basically degrading your insurance policy so that when you need to call it up, you may not get what you're looking for. So how do we get here? Well, that was an interesting part of, of, of all this is um, I looked at, I was looking for the root causes of this increase reliance on government support in the military by Canadians. What is it? What happened that led to where we are now? Well, I basically categorized those, those root causes in, in five different categories. I only have four there, five different categories. Uh, one of them is uh, societal. Well, they're all societal changes. I looked at societal changes, and those changes I, I, I categorized in four different categories. One of them is community cohesion and social capital. Uh, that took me way down a social science rabbit hole that uh, did not know existed. And then, uh, and then I also looked at the CAF media presence, the increased expectations from government, uh, the impact of mass media and, and, and information, and finally, politics. Um, so basically, in terms of decreased cohesion and, and, and community resilience, uh, I looked at a bunch of stuff here. One of them is... Uh, I was, I was trying to figure out what's happening in our communities that results in them being less resilient. Uh, I looked at the impact of urbanization as opposed to rural living. Uh, we know that rural communities tend to fare better in times of emergencies than urban communities do, and our country is becoming increasingly urbanized. Uh, we looked at economics. I was trying to figure out who does most of the community building activities? Who does the most volunteering? Uh, and it turns out to be the middle class. The rarely poor and the really rich don't do any of this or less of this. And, and our middle class is shrinking. Uh, we looked at immigration. How does that impact all of this? Well, it turns out that volunteering is one of the key indicators to social cohesion and, and, and social capital. Uh, those communities that, that have a better sense of volunteerism tend to fare better in times of, of emergency. Uh, so it was a super interesting to figure out, okay, so who does the volunteering? So looked at this, looked at economics, looked at, uh, at, uh, at new Canadians. Turns out that the first generation new Canadians don't volunteer as much, not in a traditional way, at least. Uh, further generations will, but the first generation doesn't. We took in a million people last year. So that is a lot of people that we're not tapping in to right now because they just don't, at least in the structure we currently have. Um, so all of these societal changes were super interesting. Uh, looked at um, um, so all these changes in, in Canadian demographics over the next few years will likely make things worse, unless we have a deliberate action plan at the national level to reverse that trend. Uh, as we become more urbanized, uh, focused on high uh, technology uh, work. Uh, work from home, uh, less uh, communal type employment, uh, people will get less resilient and social cohesion will keep, will keep degrading. So we need to address it. Uh, increased expectations from government. It has increased dramatically over the last few years. As the government keeps doing more earlier for longer using the CAF, it raises social expectations that, well, 
yeah, the military is just like the fire truck. When we call, when there's an emergency, they will show up because I see it all the time on TV. And that's, it just raises expectations from government members and from the population. So it is uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, aspect of it. Uh, Cath media presence. That was super interesting in that it appears that a very a relatively small military contingent deployed on a domestic operation has a completely disproportionate outreach and visibility, regardless of their actual impact on the ground or, or how big or small they actually represent in the whole uh, response force, um, simply because they are backed up by a massive public affairs architecture that, that puts them all over the news. And the, so it's all done for good reasons, but it leads Canadians to believe that, oh my God, the army's here is saving the day again. No, there are only a hundred of, of thousands of volunteers working, but they're the only ones that make the news every day. Not the only ones, but they, they make the news a lot. So that has a huge impact. Um, the influence of politics, I think that one is critical because uh, it turns out that in my opinion, it is the single most influential factor over the last 30 some years that has led to this increase in the use of the cap. And I explain why, because it is not negative. It's all done for good reasons. There's no bad intention ever. So the reason for this is partly because of the way our emergency management structure, um, our emergency management system is structured. The large majority of emergency management capabilities are held at the lowest level, at the municipal level, in the communities, with uh, some at the provincial level. But what that does is that the federal government in times of emergency does not have a lot of tools at its own disposal uh, to help communities in need. The, 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 the most recognizable entity in this country, easily recognizable as a federal entity, is the military. It, is, it happens to be the only tool in the toolbox. Not the only tool, but the only physical tool that you can easily recognize. So when a neighbor comes calling for help, and all you have in the toolbox is a hammer, are you going to bring the hammer? And you'll figure out how to use the hammer because that's all I got. I got to figure it out. So, uh, so that has led to the government using their only tool more and more often and people getting used to it and, and, and requesting it more often. We have, I call it the politicization of the, of the CAF. We have uh, the RFA process, the process through which provincial and territorial authorities request for assistance, uh, request assistance from the military is, is actually well designed. It is meant to uh, mitigate the duration and the scale of CAF involvement in domestic operations, but the politics tends to override the system and the CAF get called upon or get called in uh, way earlier than required uh, and generally long before provinces have actually exhausted all other options. Uh, and for political reasons. Uh, second aspect of politics is the absence of a cost recovery mechanism. And that one's important because uh, when a province requests assistance from a different province or from, uh, or from the federal level, uh, they are uh, uh, theoretically liable for all costs incurred. But in practice, that never happens. The federal government does not cost recover from provinces as per policy, for political reason, because it may be perceived negatively uh, to be uh, to be cost recovering from a province that that is experiencing a crisis, so that leads to uh, a disincentive to use fiscal prudence by provinces, use task appropriate resources, or to release the CAF as soon as as they can uh, when it's free. If it doesn't cost anything, ask for it early and keep it for as long as you think is is a good idea because it doesn't cost anything anyways. So uh, so that one's a big one. Uh, if the federal government started cost recovering as per policy, uh, it would likely decrease the demand significantly because provinces provinces would quickly realize that it is often the most expensive and least efficient uh, resource available to them ever, and they would quickly stop asking for it or would ask for it when they really, really need it. Uh, another one is the absence of an independent review system. So if you think of the uh, Emergencies Act, when the Emergencies Act is invoked by the federal government, it automatically leads to a, uh, a public inquiry into the use of it to figure out if it was really necessary and to prevent uh, reoccurrence in the future. There's no such thing for the use of the CAF. A simple annual review 
from an independent body would help minimize or at least provide a check and balance to the effects of politics in, in, uh, in the use of emergency management. All this leads to the CAF no longer being used as the force of last resort and often being used as the first of force resort, the first resort or the easy button, as many people say. So where do we go from here? Well, I believe that there are two main components to, uh, to finding a effective and, and sustainable solution to this, to this problem. I believe that one, we need to, uh, to increase humanitarian disaster relief capacity at all levels. And two, we need to build resilience in Canadians and in Canada for our infrastructure. So the National Disaster Relief Organization, that's, that's, that's me. I invented the name just as a generic term so that I could use it again. Uh, but it, it, it represents the organization I believe we need to do this. I'm not prescriptive. I'm not giving the answer, the silver bullet. Here's how it's going to be structured and how it's going to work because I don't pretend to, to know everything that, 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 is, uh, that needs to be known to do. But what I'm, what I'm offering is a list of principles and key factors that need to be considered when developing that organization in order to be effective and, and mitigate the impacts or, or the deficiencies we currently have in the system. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, factors that I've looked at is uh, the role of the federal government. In, in other words, it doesn't change all that much. It remains one of synchronization and, and coordination. Uh, it provides the framework so that other organizations can fill that, 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 that uh, organization. Uh, a, a standing force that is robust enough to intervene on short notice anywhere in the country for as long as required it is, is not realistic uh, nor efficient. What we need is a structure uh, that provides the training, the architecture, the command and control uh, for a force that is primarily composed of volunteers. And that is decentralized because decentralized decentralization of resources is absolutely a critical part of any emergency management system. That's why police forces have more than one uh, police stations in the city, and there's more than one fire brigades in the city, is you need to be closest to where the emergency happens to be effective. Um, that organization needs to incentivize new Canadians, needs to figure out how we do this. It will serve two purposes. One is it will massively grow the potential pool of volunteers to help that have a bunch of skills that they're bringing to bear, and two, it will provide them with a, an easy way to rapidly grow their own social network, uh, get to know all the right people in their towns, uh, get involved in their communities, learn the language, learn the culture. It works both ways. And countries that have done it have seen great uh, benefits out of it. And finally, it needs to be a whole of nation uh, system. And by, by this, I mean that we don't need to reinvent everything. We have amazing emergency response capabilities in this country as it is. They're just under-resourced. We need to bring them into that NDRO framework and then build upon it. Uh, and, then, and, uh, and that includes government organizations at all level, uh, NGOs, uh, community services, uh, charities, name it, volunteer organizations, private industry, all of it needs to be part of that, of that, uh, of that organization. Finally, the second aspect is national resilience program. In this, what I mean is that uh, I think there are three there are three ways we can do this, or three primary uh, uh, lines of effort that will need to be addressed. One is that uh, it will need to focus on youth. If you're changing society, if you want real social changes in society, not just uh, if you want it to to be uh, to be durable you need to address it with the young. You need to focus on the youth and build from the bottom up. If you make them more resilient, they will become more resilient Canadians for the rest of their lives. Focus on the youth. Uh, focus on the education and information programs. And, uh, and then we, uh, we also need to, uh, I'll get there. Uh, we also need to incentivize uh, resilience. A lot of Canadians say the only reason they don't follow all the guidelines, I don't have emergency supplies and equipment, is that I can't afford it. 
you're asking me to have three days of supply in my house. I can't even figure out how I'm going to pay for dinner tomorrow for my kids. Never mind your three days of just food sitting in the basement. Uh, or I don't have a generator because it costs $2,000 and I can't afford it. All good points. So we give incentives to build greener homes program. We can do the same thing to build resiliency in this country and it needs to be part of it. So I have, uh, through this, I have found some, some, uh, some future research uh, uh, potential avenues, I guess. One of them is how do we build resilience through our formal public education program in this country, given, especially given the difficulty that, that it is provincially legislated. And I think Michael here is, uh, may know the answer to this. Uh, one is the impact of politics. How do we do this legally? How do we figure out ways to mitigate it? I propose some avenues, but it could it could it could use more research into it. And then finally, uh, ways to incentivize new Canadians. Conclusion: It is absolutely given the the uh, the rapid uh, change of our climate and the deteriorating global security situation. It is absolutely critical that we urgently. Uh, revamp Canada's emergency management framework in order to uh, provide us with the increased humanitarian disaster relief capacity at all levels uh, across the country and, uh, and the resilience in Canadians' households and, and government architecture to allow us to resist uh, those shocks that will absolutely come at an increased rate. And if we don't do that, if Canada does not lean itself off its reliance on the military, uh, uh, we are at risk of having a military that is not able to muster the resources required to face the true existential threats that may come in, in the next few years as the world situation gets worse. So that's it. Two minutes behind. Not too bad. And uh, I will now open up for questions, comments. Uh, Liam will take some notes and uh, please provide your name so that he can note it. If I have more questions afterwards, I can reach out. Um, All right, Mike, thank you and, uh, and great presentation. And uh, Liam, my name is uh, Colonel Tyler Donnell. I'm the US <laughs> Army War College Division Defense Fellow. And uh, one, thanks for breaking the ice for this uh, before me as well. Uh, you kind of mentioned up front um, specifically that you're focusing on uh, the impact of CAF, humanitarian disaster relief, and that there's uh, 149 other, other categories. Uh, and just kind of thinking back to what the U.S. Army gets called that often, uh, EOD, explosive ordnance disposal, uh, search and rescue efforts. Um, are there anything specifically in there that you're worried about? Um, or, or I guess, why did you uh, decide to focus in on the disaster relief aspect? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So I, I expected this would would uh, would resonate for some because it is. Many of you are probably wondering, well, what else do you do? I only see you doing fires and floods and that kind of stuff on the news. Well, there is an incredible list of things that that the military can do. We do everything from supporting police operations, uh, man hunts. Uh, counter drug operations to uh, uh, to uh, explosive ordnance disposal. Uh, to that point, last year alone, uh, so BC on average gets 250 calls a year for explosive ordnance disposal. 250 a year, almost every day. Uh, so search and rescue, uh, counter terror operations, all of those things I did not focus on simply because a lot of them are built into our military. Search and rescue and counterterrorism is, is a good example where a br branches of our entire military are designed, funded, and, and meant specifically to do that. So it's not a problem. It doesn't cause a problem in the military because that's what they exist for. And if you got away from, from it and you gave that role to somebody else, you would have to cut those thousands of people anyways, because that is their purpose in life. So it's not a problem. So so I don't want you to leave thinking, well, you know, the military shouldn't be involved in anything domestic. Not at all. Not at all. There's many good examples. The evacuation of the hospital in Yellowknife during fires last year. That had never been done. We evacuated an entire hospital thousands of kilometers away from home. Nobody else could have done it. Nobody in this country had the capability to do this. 
and it was an excellent use of the military. We showed up with strategic airlift capability, lots of medical personnel. It lasted two days, and then we they all went home and did something that, so it was a good use. Or the evacuation of three towns with Chinook helicopters in Northern Quebec on July 13th last year. Another really good use. Nobody else had the capability to do this. It was really defined. You're going to do this. Short time, get out. Perfect. Good examples. So, so I do not pretend to, or planners, sometimes a province will ask, uh, they have something to deal with that's really not something they deal with very often. They will ask for planners and, and people to help them uh, just plan for, for, the, for, for a security operation of some sort. No problem at all. That's the kind of tough stuff we can do. So I focus strictly on those things that have a real impact on military readiness, and that is strictly humanitarian disaster relief. Mike, thanks very much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I echo uh, Tyler's thoughts there. Uh, Steve Taylor, I'm a defense contractor with Canyon Group Limited, and we do get involved with uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, relief, uh, training, uh, and emergency management. Uh, you answered my question with your National Disaster Relief Organization. So, so a follow up to that, you talked about volunteers, and I saw a photograph of Team Rubicon, and yep. you know, Team Rubicon Canada exists as well, so veterans-based. And you talked about the framework, revamping the framework. Do you see a, a role for contracted support? And, you know, of course, helicopters, you know, you know, not necessarily a volunteer sport, uh, flying those. Um, how might uh, an organization or this organization yep. be supported by you know, private sector and you know, contractors yep. in particular. Absolutely. I see a huge role in it. Um, and, and I just didn't have time today to, to cover all this, but it will. Uh, so I, I believe industry. Now, there's, there's two different things, right? There are corporations that make money doing something and say we could offer a service to do this. And then we have uh, companies that do it for free as a good action for their country, and you have volunteer organizations. So all three of them have a role to play. A corporation, I'm going to use, I don't know your example as much, so I'm not going to venture into it, but I'll use, for example, at Cofrontech. At Cofrontech last year pitched uh, an idea to, the, uh, to Emergency Preparedness Canada to offer a camp service where they would keep an entire camp similar to what you see in movies where military uh, forces live overseas. So they would build an entire camp with generator, power, kitchens, uh, provide all the feeding services, everything that you need to run a camp for as long as the military needs it. It would be on very short notice. They would move it the way you need it, build it, operate it. When you're done, they collapse it, inspect it, store it, and they're ready to go. They're ready to go again for the next one. So they offered that kind of pitch to the government. It's a really good example of something that's used in many countries and that obviously comes at a cost. You have to pay for that because they have to buy all the equipment. But it is definitely, uh, it relieves the pressure from existing organization. It's a pay, uh, pay as you use it service. I totally think it, it does have its, its role to play. And I, and I do mention that in there. Um, another one would be a company, for example, Labat, beer, brewery. They have a uh, they have a, a program to offer uh, drinking water in terms in times of, uh, of emergency and they do it for free. That is their contribution to our national emergency preparedness, basically. Uh, so they store I can't rem remember, but I think several hundred thousand cans of water in one of their warehouses. At any given time, if there's an emergency in this country, Labat will move it using its own logistics uh, uh, capabilities to where it's needed. And then at some point, they will pick a day. They will shut down beer production, simply revert to water production until they refill their stock, and then they're ready to go again. It's a cool system, um, and it's a good way for companies to, to, to get involved in their communities. Uh, and then volunteer organization, absolutely. And there's countless organizations such as Rubicon Canada, the team Rubicon Canada that, uh, that does great work and that should be absolutely built into it. I think there's not one model that fits. A good example of this would be uh, FEMA in the US. 
uh, has a, a, um, a contract arrangements with companies, standing contracts with companies uh, to do mostly logistics and, uh, and uh, real life support services. Uh, when FEMA needs to move emergency supplies around their country, they use primarily the Army National Guard. Uh, now you're gonna go, why don't we just do the same? Well, easy, there's a whole list of reasons. You can just read the paper. Uh, however, their National Guard is structured differently. It doesn't have the same authorities. If the National Guard can't do it, no problem. Then they revert to those standing contracts through companies like Walmart, Target that have massive logistics infrastructure and can easily reroute trucks to pick up all these supplies and move them anywhere in the country. And that is done through Walmart, Humanitarian, I forget the name. They have a branch of Walmart Logistics that, that prepares specifically for that. So those are all cool. I, I fully agree. There's, it plays a, a, a key role, especially when we do not have other capabilities to use. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, yep. Uh, thank you again for the presentation to today. Uh, I'm Zayden Breguer. I'm just an undergrad in politics and history, uh, but I have more of a background in, in teaching first aid. Yep. Uh, and my question for you is, you mentioned that volunteer element and how important it is. Um, when teaching my courses, one of the situations that is included by the Life Saving Society is actually you have flash floods and, and response in, in as those types of situations. Um, what is what do you believe the role could be of students who are who are trained in first aid or students who are taking um, life saving through swimming lessons, for yep. example? Is that is that a feasible route to for education or should it be mainly streamlined through provincial means? I think it's both. I think it's both. And and and, and I didn't go into details onto my my national disaster relief organization, but um, I've looked at different models around the world. Uh, to try and see if there are different aspects of different models used that we could use as a to inspire our, 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 our the development of this organization. Uh, I have found most inspiration in Germany and Australia as, as systems that are really not innovative, they're 60 years old, but but really well founded in 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 a decentralized model that that builds uh, volunteer. Uh, a volunteer workforce. And I believe that, that what you're asking is can be answered in two ways. Once that organization exists and has nodes or units or whatever you want to call them, right, uh, spread out across the country, that is the venue through which you would volunteer your time uh, in this country and provide, for example, first aid training to all those volunteers that, 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 uh, that provide their time and effort. And uh, or you can do this officially through I, th I think we need to do both. We need to figure out how do we put this into our school curriculum? You learn how to build a birdhouse in whatever course you take in high school. Okay, not terribly useful, but but you're learning skills that you could actually apply to something else. So if you're gonna bird, if you're gonna build a birdhouse, why not build something that that will be absolutely useful next time there's a flood, next time there's a fire? And it, so how do we influence our education system? I think is 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 critical. And I'm not a specialist. I don't know exactly how to do this. How do we all agree across Canada to make sure that we all teach this? I don't know. I don't know how we do this. Uh, maybe it's not easy, but but if it's critical enough, we will have to get to it. And then, um, so I hope it kind of answers your question. Uh, I could tell you so much more about this this organization, but okay, questions. Let's go with questions. If if we run out of questions, I'll tell you more. Yep. Uh, hi there. Uh, again, thank you for the talk. My name is Arjun Ram. I'm an MA history student, and myself, I'm uh, also like a army reservist. So you brought up how uh, troops and assets are sort of sitting around uh, at times during some of these domestic yep. operations. So my question to you is: Do you think that's due to poor planning or uh, uh, lack of proper equipment and logistical support? Because in my experience too, I'm aware like in the last four-ish years, there's been a lot of cases where like a lot of my personal friends have been called up for domestic ops and they're sitting around, they're being paid to sit at home or they're being paid to sit at barracks. And then you kind of see sometimes two people saying, you know, well, we need more help. And it's so what 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 is causing that specifically? If if you could. It's a complex better. question um, because every, there's, there's many different issues here at play. 
One of them is if you've if you've been called to your unit and you sit around at your unit and you didn't even deploy, that is probably the military's over planning, because we know things are burning in whatever area of this country. We know they're going to come asking. So let's just do we have money? Yeah, let's just put them on the payroll right now, and then they're ready to go. The reason they do this in the reserve is because one of the problems with trying to use our reserve to do this is that the reserve was never designed to do that. According to our National Defense Act, there are many, many complexities with using the reserve on a short uh, 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 timeline, basically. Anytime you want to use a reservist that is meant to be uh, used as a uh, on a part-time, what we call class A, part-time basis, and you want to activate them for active duty full-time, you need to do an administrative uh, 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 process basically to make sure that they're physically fit, uh, that their pay is in order, that uh, all of their paperwork is in order, and that takes time. And those organizations are not don't are not resourced adequately to do this rapidly. They're all a bunch of people that show up six days a month. So when you try and do this in 36 hours, we need a thousand people, it causes an incredible amount of stresses in that organization that is not was never designed to do this. And we do it, but we do it on the back of our people. So if they called you earlier, it is likely because the CEO said, in order to reduce the impact on my people, I will be pre proactive and I will bring them in. And if they don't go anywhere, then I just wasted my money because nobody's going to pay back for this. But it's my way to make sure that my, my admin staff are not completely burnt out by the time they have the road. Um, another example is, for example, helicopters. Helicopters may get deployed to... Our equipment is typically not um, um, perfectly adapted to the type of task we do on domestic operation. We buy that equipment to fight to fight wars, not to go move people around a forest fire or to so we end up with equipment that is not necessarily terribly useful in those operations. Uh, a helicopter may come in, they look at the size of it, they go, oh my God, that thing's going to lift so much. And then they realize that our lifting capacity is not that much because we have so much more equipment on the aircraft than, than a, an equivalent civilian helicopter. We don't have water firefighting equipment on those helicopters. Neither do we want to go there because our training bill is, is really, really big to learn and to be ready to fight. The last thing we need is to have people training to do Bambi bucket water operations uh, when that's not our role. There's, uh, so, so our equipment sometimes is not perfectly adapted to it. Our trucks are not perfectly adapted to it. And that results in uh, we may be sitting at a fire where our helicopters aren't flying or they're used to do VIP transport. And our troops are like, what the hell? I'm f carrying journalists and politicians around and showing them the, the, the floods, right? Well, because you can't do anything else with them. They can't fight fires. That's not what they're, they're not trained or equipped to do this. Uh, or, or they're just too big. You bring in a Chinook helicopter, it's extremely rare that on a forest fire operation that you're actually going to need that size helicopter. So they end up flying around with a pallet of hoses in the back and five or six firefighters that you could have done with an aircraft that cost a fraction of the cost. But that's all you got. My hammer is all I got. So I brought my hammer and I'm going to do what I can with it. Uh, but it's not the perfect tool for the job. Um, so put this in perspective. Last, so on uh, August 23rd of 2023, last summer, at the peak of uh, fires in BC, um, I had six helicopters deployed to, uh, to BC uh, out of my formation. And, uh, and uh, BC had on contract 135 helicopters that day. So I represented six of 135 aircraft that day. So when people see the news, they go, my God, thank God the military is here. I saw all these big helicopters come in. You just didn't talk to the other dozens of companies providing support that represent the large majority of the useful task force. You just notice the green ones. But there were 135 others there that, that just don't get any attention. So it's misleading. It's not misleading on purpose. It's, it's accidental. But it, is, it leaves an impression that the military saves the day. When we deploy 24 people to an old folks home, 
and they're all over the news and people think, oh my God, they're saving Canadians in old folks home. Did you know there's 48,000 doctors in Ontario? So if I deploy six to an old folks home and we get the impression that the military saved the day, the province has 48,000 doctors on payroll, right? Like it, 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 is, it, it just leads to a, a misperception of what we can actually do. We're really, really small at the end of the day, right? We're a small organization compared to what Canada can do as a country. If we're sending trucks to move supplies around the country with a dozen trucks, a dozen truck is a, has a large impact on the military formation. But at the end of the day, the country can muster so much more, so much more. If you give them the framework to actually enable this, uh, they will grow this to thousands of trucks rapidly. We can't do that. So it's critical that we understand that the military is not the answer to this. We need to mobilize our country to have a true impact. Michael. Time. One more question. Sure. Depends how long it is. <laughs> uh, Michael, CIDP. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing in, in that last uh, part of your response was that there's a messaging problem where the CAF needs to demonstrate how bad the value for money proposition is. Because there's both a, a, a lack of cost yep. and an overestimation of benefit. Yep. And I'm wondering what, what are the, the public affairs tools that, that you want to use for that? Is this a That's... auditor general? Is this... So... Uh, it's an downplay. extremely sensitive topic, right? Because that is a political problem. Once the once once the request for assistance reaches the uh, federal uh, 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 emergency preparedness, and they decide that well, we think the CAF is the most appropriate solution, and the RFA gets pushed to the Minister of Defense, who then uh, directs the CDS to use any resource at its disposal to enable whatever the province has requested. Who are we to go against it, right? We are that tool now that they've identified as the best tool they have. So do we do it? Yes. If you pay attention, there's lots of, lots of bits of information you can get. The CDS is constantly talking about it in front of parliament, in the media. So he's doing what he can to some extent, right? Like uh, those numbers are there, but once a political, we are just a political tool, right? We are a tool just like any other tools in the federal government. Once that decision has been made, what we need to influence is making the decision in the first place. And we try, we have uh, liaison officers across all provincial emergency management uh, permanently to make sure that we help them craft their request for assistance to minimize the time, minimize the scale, or not do it at all and use something else. Uh, and we are increasingly successful at it. But unfortunately, not all the time. And once they get deployed, one of our major problems is pulling them out. It is super easy to bring them in because of all the reasons I've just explained and impossible to get us out. Once you're there sitting on your rucksack in the, in the, in the Rockies, and the province says, no, we don't really need you guys. Like we, We're good. At that point, it is a political decision to pull us out. And for the same reason, it doesn't look good. What if we leave and it happens again, then we just look like bozos that can't decide, right? So just stay there because we don't know. So I understand why. Like it's a, if, if we were the political leaders, we'd probably do the same thing without, without a, a hard system to, to kind of make the decision easier. Um, it's all done for good reason, but it's difficult to, uh, to do. So I don't have the answer to you, but I will uh, try and address it in a little more maybe. So I know there's more questions because I did see- I'll hands. stick around anyways. So uh, Colonel Bama is going to stay around. But I want to express uh, on all of your behalf and on the online audience uh, our thanks for what was a very interesting presentation on domestic ops. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> and it did prompt a lot of things. I really appreciated the the points you brought on on perception and the, how the CAF has created a, a its own problem in certain respects to some because, extent because yep. of the perception they presented through public affairs and and being visible on the ground. 
So I, I know your final paper is going to be incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, everybody's behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah.